A Spider's Web I've been keeping a low profile, but I was prompted to write this because I've seen in the news that a certain billionaire just bought a chunk of land in Arizona to build a smart city. He's not the only one with that idea. And I have to warn people, I only barely survived the prototype. The posters for the new smart city were bright and cheery. They promised a community designed from the ground up with every need handled and every desire satisfied. I wouldn't have to worry about a thing if I lived there. Or so they promised. I didn't move immediately, of course. It was only as my rundown neighborhood turned increasingly toxic and scary that I thought I'd give it a shot. So one chilly February morning, I packed up my meager belongings and set off for Gilmanton. After two nights spent sleeping in my car at rest stops, I saw the signs, and I headed off the main highways for another few hours. Finally, there it was. The city was just a prototype and therefore not as big as Chicago or Seattle or anything like that. The high, silvery walls formed a circle whose edges just barely touched each side of the shallow, scrubby valley. People were parking pretty much anywhere, since the posters had promised we wouldn't need our cars anymore. But we still managed to create orderly rows by working together and being sensible about it. I felt like I was arriving near the opening hour of a massive theme park. And the gobs of people walking all around me were friendly and excited. We didn't even get annoyed while waiting in line for hours. It was slightly cold out, but the sun was up and we talked endlessly about how bad it was everywhere else and how good we were going to make it inside. When I got to the automatic paperwork dispenser at the front of the line, I didn't waste everyone's time like the people before me. I signed my papers immediately, stood in place for my picture, and headed on in. Those behind me cheered, and the speed of the line picked up as they began to do the same. About one in ten of those before us had chosen to turn and leave with a disturbed look on their faces. But that intermittent defection stopped once we skipped reading the waivers. An enclosed technology station was the last stop, and here the system dispensed a bracelet. I marveled at the design. It was my key, my passport, my phone, and my computer all in one. We didn't need any other devices. Everyone else divulged all their old technology, but I happened to forget that my phone was in my inner jacket pocket. The battery had died on the way down too, so the scanner gate didn't raise an alarm when I went through. The first main street opened up before me as I stepped out under the February sun and into Gilmanton proper. The first official human being was there to greet each of us. He looked quite dapper in his fancy suit, and it turned out that he was the mysterious billionaire that had built all of this. He shook my hand vigorously. Just call me Mr. Mudget. Nice to meet you, I said in awe. Where do we live in here? Pick any open residential apartment you like, he said graciously. First come, first serve, at least in this phase of the trial. That was great. I looked at the map of the city on my bracelet and looked for the highest apartment with the best view I could find. The ones next to it were already popping up as taken, so I ran over there, dashed up the stairs, and tapped my bracelet to the wall computer just before another man. He griped a bit, but finally ran off to find another place for himself. Then I sat in my new chair. The white-walled apartment was a bit more cramped than I had expected, but it did contain a bed, a couch, and a small kitchen area in addition to the chair that faced the big glass window. Looking out, I could see down my street, and I was almost parallel with the top of the outer wall of the city. I'd expected more of a view, perhaps a lake, or perhaps some of the terrain outside the walls. But it was fine. What more could I ask of a free apartment? One of the walls did contain a television. The panel opened at the command of my bracelet, and I remained in my chair changing the channels for a few minutes before I finally found a station. It appeared that there was only one station so far which was fine. It was opening day, after all. That sole channel was Gilmanton News 1, and a well-dressed man and woman at desks were reporting favorable stats of how well the first day of the city was going. After a few minutes, it occurred to me that the television was pretty loud and set right in the wall. Leaving it on, I went out into the dim, brown-walled hallway and knocked on my neighbor's door. 
It wasn't a typical door. It seemed to be made of metal with a wood layer over top to make it appear normal. All the doors were like that. It slid open to the left, and a decently attractive woman answered. I immediately stopped slouching and remembered to be polite, but Melanie hadn't noticed the noise from the television at all. See? she said, wrapping her knuckles on the wall. Soundproof. Isn't that great? It was. I returned to my room and thought about how awesome it was that I wouldn't be hounded by the noises of my neighbors like I had been back home. That night, I slept better than I had in years, and the next day I took a ride on the city's municipal rail. I could get anywhere in the city for free, and without creating any pollution. The rooftops were all solar panels, and supposedly there were wind turbines outside the wall somewhere. Mr. Mudgett had truly done it. He'd built a self-sustained city full of good and decent people. I didn't much like my assigned job, but I couldn't complain. I'd put up with worse. No, my dissatisfaction began elsewhere. About five days in, I'd gotten used to my new surroundings, and I was feeling brave. When I heard Melanie return to her apartment, I gave it about ten minutes, then went over and knocked. I had a whole excuse prepared about how I didn't know how to cook, but I did have this bottle of red wine I'd bought from the commissary on the first floor of our building. But she didn't answer. Were the doors soundproof too? I rang her doorbell. I waited a good long minute before reaching up to ring it again. This time, the door opened at the approach of my bracelet. Uh... I said loudly, directing my voice forward into the apartment. Your door just opened. No response followed. Awkwardly, I leaned in a little bit and looked this way and that. The bathroom was dark and empty, and the kitchen and living room area were pristine. Hello? I stepped fully inside. Melanie wasn't there. I checked my bracelet, which listed the apartment as unoccupied. But how was that possible? I'd literally heard her return home not 15 minutes prior. Now, not only was she not present, the system said her apartment wasn't owned at all. How had she even gotten out? I checked behind the couch and under the bed. There were no possessions, but that wasn't unusual since we'd all left everything behind when we arrived. The only strange detail I noticed was what looked like a bit of broken tile on the wall in the shower and the slightest trace of blood below, as if someone had slipped and hit their head. There was nothing I could do but return to my apartment. Gilmanton News 1 was still the only channel, and it was on televisions on every street corner, in every shop, at the gym, and even in the bathrooms. Two talking heads were busy debating which aspects of Gilmanton were great, or the greatest. I left it on, but didn't really pay attention until I wondered if I could get on the news program to ask about Melanie. Would that be weird? I let the idea simmer for a day or two. When I still hadn't seen her in that time, I decided to try to find the news studio. It wasn't listed on the map, but I wandered through the crowded city streets in search of an antenna powerful enough to send the signal. There was one toward the back of the industrial area, and I left the crowds behind to creep through narrow maze-like alleys. The walls here were just plain brick with no decoration, and I found myself feeling a little claustrophobic. In one dead-end passage, I saw a pile of old tools and crowbars. By the time I found the base of the antenna structure, I was more than ready to leave, especially because there was no new studio at all. Through a window, all I saw were big stacks of computers. That night, sitting in the dark in my apartment, I watched the news anchors and talking heads on Gilmanton News 1. I mean, really watched them. After two or three hours, I began to see the same patterns in how they moved their heads or talked, and it was especially obvious after six hours. The people on the news were computer-generated. They were just facades reciting programmed talking points. That chilled me to my core, but it was a smart city after all. Didn't it save money to not have a studio or staff when computer-generated reporters worked just as well? Still, I was left unsettled. The news was our only source of outside information, and according to them, the rest of the country was falling apart. Crime and illness were everywhere, spearheaded by corrupt politicians that were basically monsters. Meanwhile, Gilmanton was a shining example of perfection. 
We were safe from our fellow citizens outside, we were far more productive, and we had zero crime. I sent a few emails to old friends to confirm if that was true. But the system returned my messages with an error, saying those emails no longer existed. Maybe they'd changed. I wasn't sure. I tried to make some phone calls on my bracelet, but the system told me those numbers were no longer in service. We had the internet too, but I only seemed to be able to access local Gilmanton websites. The comments on all these sites were full of citizens declaring how awesome the city was, and I scanned these until one caught my eye. It was Melanie. That was definitely her tiny picture next to her comment, and it had been posted the day before. Did that mean she was alright, and had just moved to a different apartment? I wondered if I'd put her off somehow and she moved to get away from me. My concerns finally took me to Mr. Mudgett himself, the only actual person I could find that was in charge of anything, and he allowed me into his office with a warm smile. Of course I'll look up your friend, he tapped away at his desktop computer, the only one I'd seen anywhere in Gilmanton, and he nodded. Says here she didn't feel like this was a good fit. She left the city to return to her old life. I shrugged. Oh, figures. Last week, Mudgett continued. Yep, nothing to worry about. She's back home. My blood ran cold. I kept my face neutral. Thanks for the info. Of course. How could she have left last week if she'd just commented earlier that day about how great the city was? I memorized her comment and began looking. There it was, on another forum. Another user had used the exact same phrasing including the same typo. My god, it was fake. The news, the comments, everything I perceived as my community, it was all fake. As I lay huddled under my blankets in bed, I realized I didn't really know anyone at all here. I'd wandered through the labyrinthine streets, I'd seen crowds, but I didn't really have any friends. All the people I'd talked to and commiserated with had been online, and I went through all my old conversations one by one until I found the same replies elsewhere. I'd literally been talking to programs, not people. And where the hell was Melanie? I returned to her apartment, but it was owned. An extremely overweight man answered the door and seemed annoyed. I pushed past him and headed to the bathroom. Did you clean up the blood that was in here? He stopped complaining and said with concern, Uh, yeah? Why? I poked around the shower until I noticed something odd. The bottom seemed to have a very thin black line. What's this? It started leaking after a couple days, he told me. Who knows why? I let that one pass to avoid hurting his feelings. His weight had broken something loose, and the bottom of the shower seemed to move slightly when I pushed on it. I'll be back, I told him, and I left immediately for the industrial area of the city where I had seen the discarded tools. They were the only useful objects I could think of. There existed no mechanisms elsewhere for the citizens to actually do anything useful. My neighbor was waiting for me with his door open when I returned with a crowbar. He too wanted to know what the hell was wrong with his shower. Together we angled our might, and the bottom of the shower fell away into darkness. It was a trap door. He stared at me in confusion. What is this? I could only shake my head. A sliding tube went down into darkness slickened by the water of the shower itself. I think my previous neighbor fell here. Should I avoid taking showers then? Yes, I frowned. This is real. This is dangerous. Ah. Uh. He only sort of seemed to grasp that something was wrong. Gilmanton's so great. This must be a fluke. I'll call maintenance. I nodded in supposed agreement with him and made an excuse to leave. How oblivious could he be? They'd built a goddamn slide under Melanie's shower. The intent couldn't be anything else. That kind of thing wasn't an accident. In tracking the possible trajectory of the slide, I went down to the basement of my building and found more twisted and confusing tunnels lined with old gray brick. These were not on my bracelet map. Before I knew it, I was lost. I began making marks on the gray brick like I should have from the start, and slowly I began to understand the lay of the area. When I came to a thick metal door, I was reasonably sure it held the destination of the slide. 
and I forced it open with about twenty minutes of angry prying. What I saw in there will haunt me for the rest of my life. There was not just one slide. The ends of at least a dozen tubes jutted from the wall, some of them still spilling shower water. They were all pointed at various cages which contained women that had fallen into them, like rag dolls. One of the cages held a sullen and bloodied man. The tables between the cages held bodies in various stages of dissection, and there was a vat of acid in which a still-living man was vainly trying to climb out along the smooth metal walls. The worst part? This underground menagerie of tortures was decorated like a ritzy office from the late 19th century. There were luxurious shelves containing old books, a fancy chair carved with century-old motifs, and a desk with, among other things, a quill and ink jar. This was not a dusty torture chamber, nor a place of grim business. Someone very much enjoyed this room. A whisper originated from a back cage and I saw Melanie's gaunt face. She waved me over and skirted the acid vat and one grasping woman from a table who was still alive despite her open chest cavity. Approaching the bars, I looked for the mechanism and began prying with my crowbar. She was free in moments, and she left behind the pile of people without a second glance. They had cushioned her fall and even given her some clothes, but none now lived. I was no hero, I didn't stay to free everyone else, nor did I try to ambush and fight whatever it was that had designed this nightmare factory of a city. Melanie and I ran through the confusing basement hallways for nearly an hour before finding the stairs up, by pure luck. Mr. Mudgett was there in the lobby of our building, waiting for us with a grin. We ran past him and he made no move to stop us. They're killing people! We screamed at the few people walking by in the chill night air. There are trap doors under the showers, and they're torturing and killing people in the basements. All we got were annoyed looks. One older man said, That would never happen in Gilmanton. Melanie screamed in his face and held up her bruised arms. What does this look like to you? You're just not worthy of living here. You've obviously made some bad choices, the man replied before moving on. It was then that we realized that nobody would hear us. Not only did they live in soundproof little cells, their minds were encased in similar prisons. Gilmanton News 1 was their only source of information, and every single day they were surrounded by automated comments and discussions reinforcing the idea that everything was alright and Gilmanton was perfect. Even if we got through to someone, the community at large would never listen to us. We ran a long and exhausting circle around the edge of the city that took until dawn. But there was no way out. We'd felt safe behind them, for how well they kept out vagabonds, drifters, and other fears. But those walls kept us inside just as efficiently. As the sun crested the tops of the buildings, Mr. Mudgett walked slowly up to us, with that same grin. Finding a second wind, we ran again. We hid in a convoluted nest of alleys. Mr. Mudgett rounded a corner near noon, still grinning. Exhausted to the point of near collapse, we ran and hid in a highly populated shop. Mr. Mudgett entered to an array of applause from our fellow citizens. Thank you, thank you. Now please go about your business. I'm a humble man. The others began to filter out at his unspoken request for privacy. Melanie screamed at them that he was going to kill us, that he was killing people even then, and they just spit on her and called her a crazy whore. When I insisted that she was telling the truth, they sneered and asked, What about those politicians outside these walls? They're far worse. Explain that before you try to recriminate the great Mr. Mudgett here. I stared at them in confused horror, but they left, and the door to the shop swung shut after them. Mudgett just watched us with that same eager grin. How do you always know where to find us? I demanded. He laughed. You're literally wearing a tracking device that tells me every single thing you say or do. I looked down at my bracelet. It had been required for every aspect of life. Even if I'd taken it off, I couldn't have opened doors, bought food, or taken the rail system. Somehow, I hadn't really had a choice. He walked a slow, humored circle around us. Hmm... 
Shall it be the acid pit for you? Or perhaps asphyxiation? His eagerness grew as he spiraled closer. Maybe I'll see how many limbs and organs I can remove while still keeping you alive. I haven't tried that one in at least a hundred years. It really takes someone special to make that much effort worth it. Melanie clutched my arm while asking, A hundred years? He can't be that old. His laugh was filled with pity. Oh, you poor thing. I've been building my murder castles for a very long time. That phrase sparked something in my memory. But it wasn't possible. You can't be him. You can't be H.H. H. Holmes. They hung him for his crimes a hundred years ago. A simple bribe to the right people, and they executed the wrong man, he said with a widening smirk. A trick I've used a dozen times while further delving into the secrets of extended life. I looked to the shop owner in the corner, the only one who had not left, but he just cowered and pretended not to notice us. There would be no help there. I raised my crowbar, but Mudget's eyes lit up. Ooh, do try that. I so do love the sensation. You might even cause my organs to cease functioning for a few minutes. He leaned close and breathed on my face. It's like a little vacation from being alive. I'd welcome it. I stepped back, desperate for any option. In that motion, I felt my old cell phone in my jacket's inner pocket. With my free hand, I retrieved it, pretended to tap a few buttons, and held it up to my ear. I'll call the police. At that, his sadistic grin finally faded. That would be very annoying. I've only just now set up shop. Let us go, I told him loudly. Just me and Melanie. We'll just go, and we'll never trouble you again. He shook his head. I can't allow that. You'll sing like canaries the moment you're free. He sighed. The girl stays here. No! Melanie shouted at him. And will not be harmed, Mudget continued with an annoyed tone. Your leverage is your knowledge, so I will not harm her. My leverage is her well-being, so you will not tell anyone what you've seen here. Fair deal? Melanie pleaded with her eyes, but I didn't see any other way out. I don't know if that made me a coward, an asshole, or both, but I had to take the deal. I apologized silently and turned away from her. Mudget walked me to the front gate himself and let me go. He never even suspected that my phone was out of battery. I was forced to walk for miles to find civilization again, since he'd kept my belongings and keys. Not that it mattered. The cars outside had all been cleared away, likely sold for scrap. As far as the world was concerned, Gilmanton didn't exist. And even if it did, nobody specific had ever moved there. I could still hear Melanie's shouting for me over the walls as I began my long walk home. That's why I've spent the last few years keeping a low profile, and not telling anyone about the horror that is Gilmanton, even as more smart cities are slated for being built. Thing is, I don't think I'm risking Melanie's life by talking. We kept in contact by email so I could be sure she was safe. But in the last few months, I've started to notice patterns in her responses. I looked up the name of my overweight neighbor back in Gilmanton whose shower I'd broken open, and I found one of his relatives. They too were still receiving emails from him. The words were the same. The emails were fake. I didn't tell them that. I didn't tell them that he was dead. I didn't tell anyone that Melanie had probably been chopped to pieces minutes after I departed. I'd been corresponding with a program and had never known it. But now, I have to speak out. It's not just that more smart cities are being built. I survived a smart city built on a small scale, but now I'm starting to see the bigger picture. Whenever we give away our self-determination, whenever we give away free thinking, we put our fates in the hands of others. Men of wealth and vast cruelty have been building murder castles for a very long time, just as Mudget said. But the walls are not always bright silver, nor so obvious.